Hey everybody, this is Mrs. McDaniels, and we're going to go over coronary vascular disease. This will be a quick overview just to help you um, focus on some of the highlights and what you need to know for testing. Here are some facts um, you can review. You're not going to be tested on these, but it just kind of gives you a good idea of how many people are affected and how much money it actually um, costs on the healthcare system. Um, in terms of treating these treating these folks. The heart disease map here, we went over this in class, just gives you a sense of the death rate and also um, when you're actually going to the PowerPoint yourself, if you click on this, it will take you to an interactive where you can kind of look at heart disease in South Carolina. So coronary atherosclerosis, and we're talking about the heart here, is the most common type of cardiovascular disease. So we're talking about um, in the heart itself, um, where before we were talking about like in the in the arteries throughout the body. Atherosclerosis, um, remember, is an abnormal accumulation of lipids or fatty substances and fibrous tissues in the lining of the arterial blood vessel walls. So we're talking about in the vessels of the heart itself. These fatty substances block and narrow the coronary arteries, which cause reduced blood flow and oxygen to the heart muscle. When you have a chance, um, this is a good patho overview of atherosclerosis um, put on by Khan Academy. So risk factors, those that cannot be modified, we're going to look at age, gender, ethnicity, family history with first degree relative with premature diagnosis. So this is another good visual. Things that are modifiable, um, issues with diabetes, hypertension, smoking, drug use, uh, for example, co cocaine and methamphetamine, excessive alcohol use, obesity, physical um, inactivity, and dyslipidemia. So there is a lot of evidence um, that suggests that conditions that cause inflammation can also increase the risk for um, coronary vascular disease. So things like BMI, elevated, um, excuse me, elevated BMI, sleep apnea, periodontal disease. Those who have a BMI above 35 have two to three times increased risk for coronary vascular disease compared to those with a normal BMI. Um, those with metabolic syndrome are even at a higher risk and to be diagnosed um, you need to have at least three of the following here. Signs and symptoms um, it will kind of depend on the amount of blood flow that is actually being impeded uh, to the heart muscle. Do the obstructive blood flow the heart um, can't get adequately oxygenated and at times cardiac muscle death can actually occur. So remember terminology, ischemia is going to be reduced blood flow, uh, angina pectoris um, is going to be a result of the ischemia to the heart, which um, is chest pain. Significant blood supply loss or obstruction can lead to uh, myocardial infarction or heart attack and heart damage can also cause low cardiac output which leads to heart failure. Classic signs and symptoms um, when there is cardiac cell death, acute onset of chest pain, patients may describe it as crushing, a shortness of breath, fatigue, sweating which is diaphoresis, nausea and vomiting. The pain of an MI can be differentiated from angina by how persistent the pain is despite rest and the administration of nitroglycerin. And that right there um, is a very, very important point for you to understand right there. Okay. Women typically have nonspecific symptoms and elderly um, can have what's called silent coronary artery disease. Disease management, um, controlling cholesterol, 
watching the hyperlipidemia. There's a lot of medications that can be used for this, that we'll, and we'll discuss some of them, but you can find them all in your Honan book. Managing hypertension, um, that's through med compliance, diet, and exercise, and controlling diabetes. Again, that's with med compliance, A1C, diet, and exercise. Some of those meds, um, the ones that you'll be tested on for sure, you'll have your statins. Um, it can raise blood glucose levels and put somebody at risk for rhabdomyolysis. You can also elevate liver enzymes. So you need to watch for those um, that actually have chronic um, or active kidney disease. Um, niacin can cause flushing, elevated blood glucose levels, and hepatic toxicity. So again, absolute contraindication for those with liver disease and severe gout. Um, fibric acids like phenofibrite can cause um, indigestion and your bile acid subsequents sub, sub um, can cause some GI distress. So the two big ones that you will see a lot of times um, are these top two and you see a big issue with them is that they both elevate blood glucose levels and really shouldn't be used for those who have issues with liver disease. Cholesterol, make sure uh, you know your values. Total cholesterol should be less than 200. Your LDL should be less than 130. And that's going to be your bad cholesterol. Your HDL is your good cholesterol, males greater than 45, women greater than 55, triglycerides, males 40 to 160, and females 35 to 135. And ways that um, I told you to remember, um, L can think here from this picture, Lucifer is bad, HDL, heaven is good. Um, so just some ways to kind of remember the difference. So when um, somebody, uh, one of the big signs um, of arthrosclerosis of the coronary artery um, disease is going to be angina pectoris. There's different types and basically the pain is a result of the heart's need for oxygen so basically exceeds the supply and causes pain. So there are stable, unstable, intractable, refractory, refractory, refractory. That just doesn't sound right. Refractory, refractory. Okay, I'll say that about six more times and it won't make any sense to me. Variant or silent ischemia. Pathophysiology of this, um, again, atherosclerosis. Um, Usually it's seen when there's a blockage in a major coronary artery. Um, the heart actually obtains huge amounts of oxygen uh, to meet its demand. So when the body needs increases, blood flow increases. So if there's a blockage, uh, it's going to re result with ischemia and, the, and cause that pain. Your angina risk factors are going to be the same as arthrosclerosis. So this is um, a good chart, just a kind of overview. It talks about oxygen supply to the heart versus demand. So if there's decreased coronary blood flow um, and demand is needed, um, then pain is going to ensue. Mechanisms that will decrease blood flow, uh, vasospasms, fixed stenosis, or thrombosis. When there is increase in O2 consumption and things that will actually cause that will be increased heart rate, heart contracts stronger, and blood pressure increases. And ultimately, when either one of these happens, it can cause angina. Um, different types, the ones that I said that you needed to know 
is going to be your stable angina, your unstable angina. This one here, the variant um, or prismetal, um, it also can be known as vasospastic. You can know these. And the big thing you need to know about microvascular angina, and it helps make sense because this is going to be the one that's more common in women, um, the location in which the angina um, is resulting from is from at the microvascular level in the heart. And so that's why women typically have different or more subtle signs and symptoms than men. So that's kind of the big thing you need to know about microvascular. Um, ATI just has these three. So those are really the only ones that I'm going to want you responsible for. But what helps is just know that stable, this is basically happens when there's a trigger, whether it's increased demand on the heart, that could be through activity or stress but it resolves with rust or nitrates. Unstable angina, this can be new onset or worsening angina, and it's unpredictable. Um, so like here, somebody knows, gosh, I get chest pains when, you know, I have to do many, you know, do more than two flights of stairs, or when I get really stressed out, I start having chest pains. Um, but this doesn't necessarily have to um, have activity to spawn it. Um, rest and meds don't seem to re to do anything, and it can actually end up leading um, to an MI. So this is the one that we're going to be concerned that somebody um, is going to become um, critical very quickly. Signs and symptoms can radiate to the neck, jaw, shoulders, and inner aspect of the upper arms, usually the left. So this is a good picture to look at right here. Kind of goes over the whole area. Patients may describe a tightness, heaviness, or choking or strangling sensation that is vice-like and persistent. Uh, those who are diabetics uh, may only feel dull pain, um, especially if um, they have like advanced stations of neuropathy. Women can have different symptoms. They may feel out of breath, nausea, um, abdominal pain, um, have like pain in, in their back around their bra strap area, have vomiting. Um, things you wanna be on alert for um, are gonna be if patients are getting anxious, lightheaded, um, pale, they're starting to have some numbness. These could be um, potential precursors to an MI. Um, and a lot of times with just stable angina, they will, their pain will subside with rest or with the administration of nitroglycerin. Again, if they're not responding to these, we may, may be more concerned that somebody is having an MI. So, Side by side between stable angina and actual MI, um, exertional or stress related, rest or nitroglycerin um, re relieves the pain, usually lasts uh, less than 15 minutes, and is not generally associated with nausea, epigastric distress, um, dyspnea, anxiety, and diaphoresis. An MI can occur without cause. The pain usually is only relieved by opiates, lasts more than 30 minutes, and has other associated symptoms with it that we um, just discussed in the last slide. There's um, different assessments, but there's one known as the PQRST assessment of angina. Um, I won't go over it, but this is a good chart to review. Medical management um, objective is going to help decrease the O2 demand of the heart while giving the patient more oxygen. That can be done either pharm pharmacologically um, plus reperfusion therapy that is needed. So like this says right here, we want to try to 
help lighten the load of the heart. Lab tests, um, when somebody comes in to just kind of rule out an MI, um, we're going to be looking for cardiac enzymes that indicates um, cardiac muscle injury. The most reliable is going to be your troponin. Diagnostic tests, uh, EKG, stress tests, and Thalman scan, and that the Thalman scan is actually going to look at perfusion. So that's the big thing you need to know is that the thallium scan is going to look for um, perfusion, just to get a sense of how much um, blood flow is occurring at rest and during stress or activity. So we've talked about a lot of these meds. Um, you won't be uh, tested on the classification of the medication, but I think if you have a better understanding, you'll understand why they're being given. And some medications can be both inotrope and chronotropic. So as you see here real quickly, digoxin can fall under a couple different categories because of how it actually works. Um, in terms of studying, make sure, like with digoxin, how should a patient um, self-administer it to them and what to look for, signs and symptoms of toxicity. For theophylline administration, um, you also want to watch for levels of toxicity and the adverse side effects with that will include tachycardia, nausea, and diarrhea. So inotrope medications, um, they're basically going to alter the force or the energy uh, of the heart muscle contraction. So positive is going to strengthen how hard um, that muscle can contract. Okay, so those medications be digoxin, dopamine, epinephrine, and amiodarone. Those that are considered negative inotropic um, are going to actually weaken um, the strength of that contraction or the force or the energy of the, the contraction itself. And those are beta blockers and, ca and calcium channel blockers. Chronotropic are going to have more to do with changing the heart rate and the rhythm. Um, and they kind of monkey with the electrical con uh, conduction of the system of the heart and the nerves that actually influence it. So those um, that positively that can increase it will be your um, theophylline and atropine. Negative that actually decrease or slow down in just the rate. Beta blockers, digoxin will do it as well and acetylcholine. Your vasodilators, um, there's a lot on this slide and you pretty much need to know just about everything. Um, nitroglycerin, this is going to prevent coronary vasospasm and reduce the preload and afterload and in doing so will decrease myocardial oxygen demand. Things you have to think about, um, you know that's used to treat angina and help control blood pressure. Use caution with those who are already on blood pressure medication and know that it can cause orthostatic hypertension. What you need to teach your patients when they start feeling chest pain, they need to stop the activity and rest. Instruct them to place the nitroglycerin tablet under the tongue to dissolve because it has quick absorption. If their pain is unrelieved in five minutes, they should call 911 or be driven to the emergency room. The um, patient can take it up to two more um, times uh, at five minute intervals and remind the client that a headache is a common side effect of this medication. Okay, that's really important. In terms of managing and storing nitroglycerin, they need to have a fresh supply, so not to take um, outdated nitroglycerin because it loses its effectiveness. It needs to be kept in a, site, a light resistant container. So typically, I would tell these patients, do not take it out of its original packaging. Just keep it in here. And you can see here the top is a screw top, so that needs to be kept on tightly because the moment nitroglycerin uh, reacts with air, again, it starts to lose its potency. 
um, instruct older female clients that she may have milder symptoms um, of angina, which can be um, dyspnea and indigestion. Um, that's abnormal for them. And because of that orthostatic hypertension, you want to talk to them about sitting and lying down and changing positions slowly. Other medications that can be used for patients, beta blockers, causes bradycardia, makes them sleepy. You want to teach a patient um, about signs and symptoms of heart failure. Um, calcium channel blockers and beta blockers, they can be used for um, those who suffer more from variant angina, antiplatelets. Talk to your patient about their risk of um, bruising and bleeding and to have caution with use with a history of ulcers. So again, that's going to be um, razor use, nose bleeds, hemorrhoid bleeds, um, and when they need to contact their health care provider about those complications. Anticoagulants are uh, typically going to be used for those um, for with an MI and if a patient requires narcotics for pain you should also again suspect that they're having an MI. All right so um, that's it. Um, hope you enjoyed the overview. Again this is uh, my favorite duo brain and heart um, and uh, heart is always uh, in uh, him, him and I get along very well. <laughs> So um, I hope you're doing well and uh, that you enjoy this presentation. Take care. Bye-bye.